أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أفضل الذكر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بسيدنا ومولانا أبي عبد الله الحسين عليه السلام وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك خصوصا أخيك كفيل الهواشم قمر بن هاشم مولاي العزيز العطشان الغريب المظلوم أبا الفضل العباس May Allah reward you all over the martyrdom of the protector of Bani Hashim the one to resemble Amir al-Mu'mineen and the lover of Aba Abdullah and his backbone, the door to your hajat, the bab of all hawaij, the one who was thirsty yet did not let the thirst affect him, the one who when he had to, he gave his arms and he also gave his eye and he gave the price of his life Aba al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam Assalamu alaykum jami'an Ya shuhada karbala wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Amma ba'd It is reported by Imam Zainul Abideen to which he said addressing his beloved auntie lady Zainab يا عما أنت عالما غير معلما وفهما غير مفهما O my beloved aunt, you are a scholar without being taught and you are a knower of knowledge without anyone teaching you صدق مولانا زين العابدين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The discussion regarding the burial site of Lady Zainab alayhi salam is a widely debated discussion within the field of Islamic history. It is one that concentrates on three primary areas whether Lady Zainab alayhi salam was martyred in the land of Sham and is currently buried there being the really popular view. Or we notice a site regarding Lady Zainab السلام, in the land of Cairo, Egypt, and the famous haram over there with the dharih, with the zuwar, similar to the situation we observe in Asham today. And of course, there are those that espouse the opinion from the Shi'i and Sunni narrative, by the way, regarding the burial site of Lady Zainab السلام, in the city of Medina al Munawwara, al Baqi'ah. All of these views come in conflicting with one another. They don't seem to relate. And however, today we look at the world of Ziyara and we notice that the primary attention is given to Lady Zainab being buried in Asham. But this begs the question, Lady Zainab was in Al-Sham, but she left ultimately. So you're telling me she returned back and over there she, Salamullah alayha, was buried. Because we understand in books of history, Lady Zainab السلام, didn't live too long after Karbala. She lived only one year and died in the 15th of Rajab, approximately. One year, the 62nd year after Hijrah, Karbala was what year? The 61st. And so this is a widely debated discussion. Why do we see claimants of the likes such as Lady Zainab in Cairo, of Dimashq, of Medina? And is this a problem? And which one can we substantiate the most? And how did Lady Zainab السلام, die? These are all very important questions. At the end of the day, if I claim to love Aba Abdullah, let me also observe who does he love the most in his life. If you ever want to expose your love to someone and show and prove them that, look, my affection to you is like nothing you will ever see in this world, they would at least want you to see who they love as well. That's how you express love. You don't love a person because of who they are, but because of what they stand for, what their principles are. 
That's why it's very critical to make sure whoever you decide to associate with, see what do they enjoy doing in their life? Who do they inspire, get their inspiration by? Who inspires them? Who motivates them? And without a lack of better words, the only biggest motivation in Aba Abdullah's life was his inner circle and family. I mean, it's quite difficult to become an, in, an inspiration to the infallible. But when we look at traditions such as Lady Zainab, you are a scholar without being taught. Ya Amma anti alima ghayru mu'allima. Or you are a fahima ghayru mufahima. And of course, when you see the stances she takes, these are not things indicative of a lay individual. She truly is a scholar to the highest caliber. How many of us love her sayings, love her statements, love her sermons? She gave multiple khutub, whether it's in Kufa or Asham, or even on the way because there are many times they stop, be it in Mosul, be it in Halab, be it even in the city of Medina. She has these sermons. I, without a shadow of doubt, know that Aba Abdullah loves his beloved sister. So if I claim to love you, let me see, by extension, who does he associate with? Now I associate myself and I ask myself, Ya Allah, make me from the lovers of Ba Abdullah. But I need to also ask the question, I know so much regarding the details of Imam Hussein's death. Can I say the same about his sister? This is a test. That's the true test. You truly love someone, see who they love, and tell me if you know the same amount of detail. We even know the exact seconds concerning the last minutes of Imam Hussein's life. The name of the killers, those who were involved, the tools that were used, what happened immediately after, the pillaging and taking. We know all of that revolving Imam Hussein, but not many can tell you the same about Sayyidah Zainab. Why? It's not a less significant death. Sayyidah Zainab salam, where do we need to begin? Lady Zainab al-Kubra the embodiment of her mother, Lady Zahra, salamu alayha. So with all this being said, let us tonight shed some light in an area that has been riddled with darkness, ambiguity, discrepancies, and not much information from the modern lovers, unfortunately, today. Let us change that narrative. Let us say with our heads high that we love you, Aba Abdullah, for everything you stand for and who stood with you, so much so we will learn even about their minutes, their details, and their information. Let us dig into these discussions, brothers and sisters. After they allowed salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. As we mentioned, Lady Zainab alayhi salam was taken captive alongside the remaining family members and survivors of Aba Abdullah. And they made their journey from Kufa. They went to <clears throat> Asham. And in Al-Sham, you found the greatest of all sermons, I would argue, in the 61th year after Hijrah ever given by her. The way she naturally gave that sermon on the spot, and these things are not prepared. Many people ask us, or even lecturers, how do you prepare for your lectures? And the response is something like, well, I spent hours reading and researching. I can't get a fact wrong. When I reference the Quran, I need to make sure I did it correctly. The Quran's not a joke my ahadith, and when I mention a hadith, I need to substantiate it, so I need to know the origin. These things require a lot of time and practice. In fact, if you read research on phobias, the top 10 list, public speaking is ahead of death. People would rather die than give lectures in front of other people because you are exposed, your insecurities are there. You are someone that is put on the spot. You're self-conscious. Maybe someone notices me in a wrong way. Maybe I say the wrong word. All these people will remember. And so with practice, these things improve. When we observe the sermon she gave in the court of Yazid, we see something impeccable, something remarkable, unprecedented, underappreciated, remarkable, fiery, legendary sermon, the likes of which we've never seen before. She speaks aqa'id theology. She condemns literally the strongest man in the world at that time. He owns the West and the East. The Byzantium Empire is at his disposal. Yazid ibn Muawiyah had confidants who were from Rome. How many of us have heard of Sir John al-Rumi, the confidant and advisor to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan? And I recall even that when they brought the family of Aba Abdullah to Sham, he had that advisor from Egypt who was a Christian originally. And he asked Yazid, he's like, Amir al-Mu'mineen, who are these people exactly? They're not ordinary people. The response came back, these people are relatives to the Holy Prophet. You know, it's hard to say 
that these are his grandchildren. So they're from Quraysh, and they are distant relatives of the Holy Prophet of Islam. So the response came, how exactly are they related? Well, if you want to be very strict and forward with it, these are his granddaughters. That got to the Christian advisor. He replied by saying, and you can find this in the Maqatil, brothers and sisters. He replied by saying, Ya Subhanallah, you know in Egypt, Masr, we have a clay tablet of the hoof print of the donkey that Nabi Isa, Jesus, son of Mary, rode when he made his way to Egypt. We preserve it and honor it. The hoof print in the mud, they took out that Jesus rode and we honor it and venerate it and beseech Allah through it. This is not something ordinary. This is the prophet of God who made his way and left that mark there. And this is what you do to your granddaughters of the prophet, the prophetic family. This was something that puzzled him. We see and notice that there is a moment after she gives the sermon, two views emerge. Either they stayed in Sham for an entire year, or as soon as she gave that lecture, and humiliated Yazid ibn Muawiyah, followed by the sermon of Imam Zain al-Abidin, they were sent back to Medina via the detour to Karbala. This happens to be the stronger view within the ulama of history and tarikh. It's not the case that they stayed an entire year, although that is suggested. But when Yazid was humiliated by that moment, he told them, okay, what do you want? They said, we want to return, but bring back the head of Aba Abdullah with us. And he allowed them to have that because of how much he was humiliated. It is, if you count and calculate, the time they returned back to Karbala was exactly 40 days later. Hence why we refer to that as the Arba'iniyyah. 40 days later. If it was a year, you wouldn't technically have the Arba'iniyyah tradition we understood today. Because it took the family of Aba Abdullah 40 days exactly from the 10th of Muharram to make it to Kufa, then to Sham. One day in Sham, one night rather, the next day they were approached by Yazid, he was humiliated, then took him all the way back. People can actually make that journey in exactly 40 days sharp. And then Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari united with them there. He wanted to join Imam Hussein. He got, and to his shock, the battle was already done. He was blind, so it took him some time. He was with his servant, Atiyah al-Awfi. When he gets there, he unites with the family of Imam al-Hussein. Now, if it was a year they spent, how would they then unite with Jabir when he makes it 40 days into Karbala? This is why many researchers have maintained that no, they didn't spend a year in Sham. Lady Zainab السلام, humiliated Yazid. Then he couldn't handle having them near him. So he gave them the option, what do you want to do? They said, return us back, but we want to go through Karbala under the condition you give us Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. This then opens another discussion. When Lady Zainab and the family returned back to Medina, what went on from that point until she died, such that we have three different claims as to where she is buried, salamullahi alayha. One of our ulama, and this is an opinion that is espoused by one of our ulama, by the name of Ayatullah Sayyid Muhsin al-Amin al-Amili, suggests that Lady Zainab began to preach and reform society in Medina, Banu Umayyah could not tolerate that, so there was an attempt made at her life. As a result, she is buried in Medina al munawwira in Al-Baqi'ah, probably. This is not sound for a number of reasons. Banu Umayyah's conduct, if you observe history, and I understand, brothers and sisters, this is a rather comprehensive historical analysis, but there's no better day like today the day of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to talk about his sister, salamullahi alayha, and the shadows that surround her death. It's very empirical that we learn this, inshallah, that Banu Umayyah's conduct was to always bring their enemies closer. If you've ever observed Hijr bin Adi al-Kindi, the lover of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, Muawiyah brought him. If you've ever observed um, Sa'id ibn al-Jubayr, Al-Hajjaj brought him, and in the court they would say, what's your problem? Why are you preaching so much? What are you trying to reform society, preach against us? Quit it, stop it, we don't want to do anything to you. They would insist and persist, then they would be killed. Or they would be exiled. We look at, for example, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. He was exiled to the Rab al-Desert with his daughter, and they died there. We look at, for example, many companions of the Ahlul Bayt, 
the conduct of Banu Umayyah, brothers and sisters, this is an empire, a dynasty, what they would do is they would dispatch assassins, but they would first bring you to them. Before the second Imam, Al-Mujtaba, was martyred, Muawiyah met up with him. What's going on? Why are you doing this? Why do you preach against me? Didn't we make a deal, a peace agreement? Imam Mushtaba said, what I am saying is teaching the lessons of the household of the Prophet. I am not conflicting you in any way. You are the one that decides to conflict with the household of the Holy Prophet. You made Salat al-Jum'ah on a Thursday. You changed the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. You curse Amir al-Mu'mineen. I am teaching the opposite. I'm trying to reform that society. He met up with him. He had a huge argument with Imam al-Mujtaba to the point where he insulted Imam al-Mujtaba. Then he couldn't handle the Imam teaching and enlightening society. He dispatched the assassin who happened to be Ju'da bint al-Ash'ath, his wife, promising her Yazid ibn Mu'awiyah. This lady, when she poisons Imam al-Hasan, she didn't get Yazid, she didn't get Jannah, she didn't get the dunya, she lost it all. We notice this is their conduct, however. So with regards to Banu Umayyah being mad at Lady Zainab and just sending the assassin to her, that is not something we have ever witnessed, brothers and sisters, within Islamic history. So this opinion, in addition to the fact we have narrations that speak of alternative deaths, alternative endings to her, let us observe the others. The other view, brothers and sisters, is that Lady Zainab is buried in Al-Sham. How many of us have gone to Al-Sham? And we've seen that beautiful haram of Zainab al-Kubra, and we wish that we were there. Can we see traditions and ahadith that substantiate this? Or is there, for example, just the claim of people that come and suggest, well, here is where she is buried. How do we connect this relative to the history? Yani she was in Sham, but she goes back. Why would anyone return back to the place that gave them the most trauma in their life? These are thoughts that are worth considering. We do got narrations, we do. We have traditions from material like Akbar al Zainabat, from a scholar and a companion of the Imams, particularly Imam Rada and Imam al Kazim. This man goes by the name of Yahya al Ubaydali. He authored a book called The News and Reports of Zainabat, anything to do with Zainab. He narrates in his material over five narrations. You can look at the hadiths there. Between him and Lady Zainab are four. Ruat, just four. So he would say, in my research, I heard from this scholar, who heard from another scholar, from another one, to Lady Zainab. So that's very close. That's easy. It's not like you're 10, you're 20, you're 15. No, no, this hadith is actually close because he was alive during the time of the Ahlul Bayt. Yahya al-Ubayd, he mentioned in his work, Akhbar al-Zainab, that Zainab salam is buried in, where? In Sham. How did that happen? The following is an explanation. She did return to Medina, like we all accept. So the ijma is that there was a return. Not that when she got to Sham, she was buried, as some people do suggest. That's not the case. They left. She returned to Medina, and she turned into a social, societal reformer, brothers and sisters. Imam Zain al-Abidin, we all know, didn't go back to Medina the moment the family returned. He stayed in the outskirts of Medina al Munawwara. There is a reason why. What would happen in Medina when they would return in the 62nd year after Hijrah, Yazid ala, sacked and pillaged Medina to Nabi in the event that is known as Waqi'at al harra Now many like to say this from the Wahhabi mentality and Salafi worldview. It's not Yazid's fault. Yazid is sitting where? And Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is sitting where? So who is the one responsible? Who had the army? Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. So if you just think objectively and politically speaking, Yazid only wanted bay'ah. Imam Hussein refused. They concocted this pathetic hadith that whoever dies and doesn't have a bay'ah on their neck, you can find it in the Sahih work, the Sahihain, dies mitatan jahiliya. Mammat wa laysa ala unuqihi. Bay'ah mata mitatan jahiliya. It's a bit different from the mammat wa lam ya'raf imam zamana critique. Who? Not the imam of your time, the khalifa. Why the khalifa? There are going to be a thousand khulafa. Give me the ma'soom. Give me the imam. There was a critique. Hussein, this applies to him. He's not giving bay'ah. Therefore, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to. Sorry, Abba Abdi, you gotta do what you gotta do. I'm so sorry. Obey the Lebanon, Ziyad had him killed. Yazid didn't want that. We read in a narration, Yazid started to cry too. So, khalas, why are you guys mad at Yazid? Be angry at Obey the Allah. I'll entertain that for one moment. Let's just say, for example, 
for all intents and purposes. Yazid ibn Muawiyah didn't intend to kill Imam Hussein, he just thought bay'ah. Already that's a problem. You want Imam Hussein to give you allegiance? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are when he is Sayyid al Shabab Ahl al Jannah? Who do you think you are? Give me one fadila from you. Heck, we always hear the opposition say, Sahabi, Sahabi. Okay, are you even a Sahabi when Aba Abdullah is a Sahabi? Are you even the Rayhan of Rasulullah when Aba Abdullah is? We don't know any narrations regarding you from the Holy Prophet. But we can't stop finding from Aba Abdullah. The fact that you want bay'ah from him is the biggest of all tragedies. That's number one. Number two, this event. Waqa'at al-Harra, the 62nd year after Hijrah. Observe the following historical timeline. 61 after Hijrah, he kills Sayyid al-Shuhada. 62 after Hijrah, he kills Rasulullah by attacking the city of Rasulullah and the sanctity of, the, of Medina Munawwara. 63rd year after Hijrah, he destroys the Kaaba. And if you think about it, the Imam, the Prophet Allah. And this guy just does not have a sense of morality, ethics. The Kaaba was catapulted by that event that occurred where people sought sanctuary from Yazid's forces. So they're like, well, the ayah of the Quran says, فَمَنْ دَخَلَهَا كَانَ amina." Whoever enters Masjid al-Haram is protected. So we're going to avoid Yazid's forces and seek refuge. Jesus is like, I don't care about any of this. Catapult them. There's, there's no safety for you, whoever enters Mecca. Catapult. The Kaaba was hit, it was destroyed. SubhanAllah. And in all of this, all of this, and you still think Yazid wouldn't kill Imam Hussein? When we agreed here, he pillaged the city of Medina. By the way, from how many people... And I understand this might come across a little PG-13. How many people were killed on that day? And how many women were taken advantage of? That year, we have narrations that say 600 women gave birth to illegitimate children. Most of them at the doors of the Haram of Rasulullah in Medina. And the Haram of Rasulullah was burnt. The member of Rasulullah was destroyed. That member of Rasulullah would go on. It was burnt. All this happened, and people say it's not Yazid's fault, he killed Hussein, but we will agree he did these other two. Habibi, if he could do these other two, he can't kill the Sayyid al-Shuhada? To him, finding it normal to do what you did in Medina, then in Mecca, this is completely normal for you, and, but Sayyid al-Shuhada is too much, too far of an extent? That's absolutely preposterous. Imam Zain al-Abidin lived outside of Medina. He wouldn't go inside. When that attack happened, Imam Zain al-Abidin was turned, turned his area into a sanctuary for all those who wanted safety. They saw that Medina was getting attacked. He said, come to me, I will protect you. He had an orchard. In that orchard, brothers and sisters, Imam Zain al-Abidin housed 400 men and women and children. Many of these men and women were Banu Umayyah originally. Some of these women, their husbands participated in Karbala to kill Imam al Hussein. Look at the merciful heart of Imam Zain al-Abidin. He didn't turn around and say, I can't protect you guys from Yazid's forces. Your husband's killed my father. He didn't do that. He says, come, you want protection? You want safety? I will protect you. Look at his merciful heart, subhanAllah. So he had that compound outside Medina. And he stayed there for an entire year, even after the city was sacked. Who stayed in Medina? Lady Zainab, alayhi salam. What was her role in the city of Medina? She became Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam's representative. Yani in one way or another, she was the prime merja in the city of Medina. Whatever you wanted from the Imam of your time, you go to her. Now isn't that what we do today with our scholars? Whatever I want from my Imam, Ajalallahu ta'ala faraja, I go to the next best thing. She turned into that, subhanAllah. Many people don't observe that. She turned into the representative of God on earth, by representing her Imam alayhi salam. And what did she do? The first majalis of Imam al Hussein were held by three women Umm al Banin, Zainab, and Sukaina. Were held by these three. Many of us think about majalis al Hussein as primarily a male dominated field. No, not necessarily. When their origins cried out Zainab, Umm al Banin, and Sukaina, they were the first to begin the majalis of Sayyid al Shuhada. And there's no harm in that, by the way. There's no shame in that. And they would say that. For a whole year, no woman from the family of Imam al Hussein would ever comb her hair because of how distraught they were. And they would not remove the black that they would begin wearing for the next five years. Specifically, when Mukhtar al Thaqafi avenged all the killers, avenged the killers of Imam al Hussein, avenged Imam al Hussein by getting rid of the killers, rather. And then from that on, they would start getting married again. Imam Zain al Abidin would say, Rahimallah al Mukhtar. 
May Allah have mercy on him. Why? Because he avenged us. There wasn't a Hashimiyah who would get married ever since the killing of Imam Hussein. Nor would she brush her hair, nor would she take off the black. We were mourning, we were dying. We couldn't handle what just happened. Until full revenge was completed. So for five years later, they would refuse to even cook food for their own selves and their own families. Do you know who would cook for them? All the ahadith say Imam Zain al-Abidin. There's no shame in cooking food for the khuddam of Imam al-Hussein. Your Imam did it. There is absolutely no shame. Read al-Ikhtasas of Sheikh al-Mufid. Read Akhbar al-Zainabat by Yahya al-Ubaydili. Read these are our ulama. Imam Zain al-Abidin will cook food, subhanAllah. Why? Because they just didn't have the heart. How am I supposed to enjoy the luxuries of life when I witness what I witnessed? Only the hujjah of Allah can do it for you, subhanAllah. It reached that point. There is no shame in being a servant of Imam al Hussein in the most minor way. I see some of the brothers over here organizing the shoes. May Allah bless them. The guys over there by the cars, the security, the this, the that, the light, those who are here recording. Whatever you do, don't think the service is only here. Everything you do, from reading poetry, to helping the kids, to organizing, to cleaning and washing whatever remains. Although we have a high standard, guys. We shouldn't make the Husseiniya a place that needs to be cleaned later on. Come on, you are working here all together. We're not going to expect others to clean after you. No, no, no. These days, be yourself. Be a lover of Hussein and represent it. And I know the worst thing ever I've seen. Where some people, they'll refuse to attend the majalis because of a certain someone in the majlis I don't like. Listen, Habibi. When you enter the Husseini of Aba Abdullah, your problems with that person, I know you remember them. Keep them by the shoes at the door. Don't bring them inside. Don't bring them inside. Those problems, keep them there. Here, Hussein. Here, Imam Hussein only. Your issues, where the shoes are. Forget the shoes, keep them outside. This sanctuary, brothers and sisters, where the dhikr of Allah is being held. That the sha'ar of Allah are being held. The symbols of Allah are being represented. Imam Zain al-Abideen would prepare the food for these women who were so physically and heartbroken as well. And so we find Sayyidah Zainab doing this effort. Yazid reaches him news that Zainab al-Kubra is about to flip society. Of course, you might hear some of the best speakers in the world, but you're thinking, I wonder what the Ahlul Bayt would be like if they gave speeches. Societies would flip. That's how they would be like. If Yazid, who's so heartless, has his heart shake, subhanAllah, by accepting to give them what they want, I can only imagine how impactful their words were. She was about to flip that entire society. The governor of Medina dispatches a letter to him. He would say to Yazid, if you want anything accomplished in Medina al munawwara get her out first. Because she has them all under control. She has them all grabbed like this. Whatever she says, they'll do. She's completely changed the society. She would begin reciting the musibah of Imam al-Hussein. She, became, she uh, began to recite the majalis of Abu Abdullah. Not lectures the way we see them, but just the musibah. If she's a, an eyewitness to these masab. So whatever she says must have been something epic and powerful, subhanAllah. She gave those sermons. He says, listen, if you want anything, إِذَا لَكَ حَاجَ فِي المدينة, Then get rid of Zainab. Yazid makes it an effort. Bring your friends close, but your enemies closer. So he brought her to Medina, uh, to Asham. How did this exactly happen? She was received by a few representatives of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. They said, listen, Zainab bint Ali, Yazid has ordered that you stop speaking. She said, I'm not going to stop. What are you going to do about it? Then you must leave Medina. Get out of here. She was compelled to leave. She, with her husband, Abdullah bin Ja'far al-Tayyar, went to Asham. When they got to Asham, Hadith says she stayed there for about eight more months and left this world, and she is buried there. That is where we come and notice that the Qabr of Lady Zainab in Asham receives its substantiating claims from. There is a third opinion, by the way. This one, if we're talking strictly textually and scripturally, this opinion has more narration supporting it, and that's the one in Cairo. In Cairo, an interesting event occurred. What brought, if you go to Egypt today, you'll see Masjid Lady Zainab, Masjid Ra's al Hussein. You will see these two masajid. One that claims Imam Hussein's head is buried there, and the other one where they claim Lady Zainab is actually buried there. Listen, I want to do ziyarah of my, my heroes. Where do I go exactly? I see all of these sites. The idea that Lady Zainab is buried in Egypt, 
also can be found in the work Akbar al Zainabat in that same material. He mentions a few opinions. This one says that Lady Zainab was given the option. You're going to be banished. Up until that point, we all maintain the same view. She gave sermons. She would speak. Yes, he found this an issue. But now, here's the difference. Either he compelled her to come to Sham, or he gave her the option. You can go anywhere in the world. Choose where you want to go. So she chose Egypt. She chose Egypt according to these traditions. That she was the one to choose it. Why would she choose Egypt of all places? Especially if you think about in Islamic history, Egypt wasn't really the kindest to the Ahlul Bayt. By the likes such as, um, uh, by the likes such as Amr ibn al-As, Muawiyah's confidant who represented him in Egypt. By the likes such as Bin Muljim, La'anatullah Ali Abdul Rahman Bin Muljim was from Egypt. He had studied there, he had been there as a Quran teacher and a scholar. Of course, he was from Medina. Umar ibn al-Khattab sends him to Egypt because of Amr ibn al-As requesting, hey, we need a scholar who teaches Quran. And he couldn't find a better person to teach Quran than bin Muljim. So he sends him to teach Quran in Masr, Egypt. Bin Muljim stays in Egypt. He grows up there. And he, left, he basically settles there. Then he is the one who's responsible for the killing of Amir al-Mu'minin. So you don't see the much like love and affection from that region, especially the death of Muhammad bin Abi Bakr, radhwanullah alayh. He's buried there. He was killed by those people. Especially if you look at Malik al Ashtar, he's buried there. He was killed by that community. So why would Zaydam alayhi salam pick Egypt, for example? On the flip side, you had many lovers of Ahlul Bayt there at the same exact time. Today, the Egyptians, they love, they have affection to the Ahlul Bayt. They may not be necessarily Shia at Ashri, but they visit her shrine, alayhi salam. So we're not going to generalize. It seems to be the case that in Egypt, there were still lovers of Ahlul Bayt present there. And she's like, look, if I give an, get an option, I'm going to pick Egypt. Maybe there are other reasons why, subhanAllah, Allahu alam. There's an issue with this opinion, though. The governor of Egypt was a man by the name of Maslamah ibn Mukhalad al-Ansari. From his last name, Ansari, he is from the Ansar of Medina. Maslamah hated Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the governor of the place you decide to choose to live off the rest of your life happens to be a hater of your father. So why would you choose that direction, Ya Zainab al-Kubra? Sayyid Zainab is not scared of anyone, by the way. He's not. You saw Yazid, you saw these people. Who is Maslam? Who, who does he think he is? She doesn't care. The tradition says when she got to Egypt, she further promoted that idea. She began to give a sermon there. Lord, Sayyid Zainab, she doesn't stop. She's not complacent. She doesn't let let people speak on her behalf. She speaks for her own self. And this is a brilliant strategy. Why? Because if you don't speak for your own issues, you know who will speak? The authority. And who was the authority at that time? And this is the problem we have today as Muslims living in the West. Sometimes we are complacent. We see Islamophobia. And no one wants to do something to change the image. As you know who begins to speak on your behalf? Islamophobes. These Muslims, they go on these channels, these news channels, these whatever, we shouldn't allow them to enter as refugees. Why? Because these guys, look, look what they're doing. Yani one riffraff out of two billion, suddenly the two billion are held accountable. How about we become representatives of Islam here? Social work, represent Islam positively, be more philanthropic. I noticed today beautifully we have the blood drive. These efforts are wonderful efforts. Bring a good image to Islam. Because if you don't speak for your behalf, you know who will? Extremists will. Well, those are the Muslims because they got control of the media. Extremists on this side and extremists on that side. Whether it's extreme Muslims or people who hate Islam extremely. You know what you should be? I want you to remember this forever. Don't be an extreme Muslim. No. Be extremely Muslim. Don't be an extreme violent Muslim. But be extremely Muslim where you are a representative of morals and principles and humanitarian rights. That's a true Muslim. Be extremely that, but don't be an extreme Muslim. Just change the words a little bit. Then your sanctuary is found on this side versus the other. Zayd, Zainab salam knows. Banu Umayyah, none come near them like their propaganda and their media. Let me counter that. Make pages online, write articles, do what you got to do. Speak out, be more involved, be philanthropic. Have more of these events, brothers and sisters. She wouldn't let them speak on her behalf. She would do so. When she enters Masr, she gives a sermon. She gets to Kufa, she gives a sermon. She gets to Sham, she gives a sermon. She gets to Medina, she gives another sermon. She gets to Egypt, she gives a sermon. Wherever she goes, she changes the hearts, by the way. 
Kufa was celebrating, they immediately began crying. Sham was partying like it was Eid, such that the companion of the Prophet, they met up with him in Sham, and they said, Ya Sahel bin Sa'ad al-Sa'adi, why do you look so confused? He says, I'm so surprised. Is it Eid today? People are dressed and happy. They said, don't be surprised if the sky falls on the earth. The family of the Prophet is being held captive right now. And he was shocked at this point. He then was flipped. Society was flipped because of Lady Zainab alayhi salam. Medina, the same thing. She gets to Egypt. This Maslama who governs Egypt, his heart broke when he heard her speak. He then said, how about you live in the palace with me and the other women of the town? She agreed to do so. After about eight months, she dies in Egypt and is currently buried there. We actually got narrations more to support this. Interestingly, if we're talking scripturally only, that's it. But if we're talking about content, let's observe what also happens. You know when someone dies, you have to pray over them. You can't just let a person die, a Muslim, and no one does Salat al janaz over them. Who then prayed on Sayyidah Zainab if she happened to die in Egypt, according to this opinion? It's Maslama, they say. He was the main man, he was the head. Is that befitting for Lady Zainab al-Kubra to have this man who was an adversary to her family to pray over her? Many say no, this is not. Another issue, Sayyidah Zainab, is she considered infallible or not? Now people are like sitting like this, oh, what are you going to say now? If you say she is, I'm going to have a problem with you. Other people are like, if you say she is, well, she's not from the 14 Masumin. So you're condemned if you do, you're condemned if you don't. There is a study within Islamic theology describing Asma. You don't need to be the Hujjah of Allah to be at a degree of infallibility. That's why they divide it. Asma Kubra and Asma Sughra. I mean, at the end of the day, Imam al Kalam's daughter, what's her name? Fatima al what? What? In Qum, what's she called? Fatima al Ma'suma. But is she a Ma'sum as we understand the Imams to be? No. But does she represent that infallibility and purity to the highest degree any human can possible? Yes. Absolutely, exact same way, Sayyidah Zainab and Abul Fadl and Ali Al-Akbar and Al-Qasim are exactly like this. They're not from the 14 Hujaj, but they still maintain that degree of purity where you can't find a black mark in their history. That's infallibility indeed. So that is a variance, brothers and sisters. Tayyib, the infallible, can the fallible pray upon them? No. So who's Muslim are praying upon the infallible like Lady Zainab? So that, now you have an issue with the whole... Egypt narrative. So you see our scholars world, they come and they start studying history and they're like, okay, this has more narrations, but the content is problematic. This has less narrations, but it makes a lot more sense. There is a third opinion, brothers and sisters. This one is the majority maintained opinion that, wait a minute, Amir al-Mu'mineen, many don't know, he had actually 27 children. From the sons, he had many. I think we counted them the other day. Of course, he had al-Hassan, Hussein, Aun bin Ali, Abbas bin Ali, Ja'far ibn Ali, Hilal bin Ali, Abdullah bin Ali, Ubaidullah ibn Ali, Umar ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, you had the Uthman ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, then you had what they describe as Abu Bakr ibn Ali, otherwise known as Muhammad al Azhar, from the boys. Then he has many other daughters. Of course, let's not forget Muhammad ibn Hanafiyyah. These are just 12 suddenly. Combine them with the girls. Because after Lady Zahra, Imam Amir al Mu'minin got married to four other women, be them Umm al Benin or the likes. Then Imam Amir al has these daughters. You notice he gives them similar names sometimes from the daughters. Zainab al-Kubra, Zainab al-Sughra, Zainab al-Wusta, and Zainab al-Ukhra. But to differentiate them, they gave them titles. So Zainab al-Kubra, Lady Zainab, as we all know her, salamu alayha. But then you will have other of these daughters. So could it be a Zainab bint Ali buried in Medina? Yes. And could there be a Zainab bint Ali buried in Cairo? Yeah. And they say the shrine in Damascus right now in Syria, they say 150 years ago, ulama began to look around in that historic area and they found a grave, a slab that is ancient and they dated it to that time period that literally reads, this is the grave of Zainab bint Ali bint Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. So they're, oh, in that case, we got narrations, we have physical archaeological proof. Allah's put the two and two. Now, is there a problem, brothers and sisters? Is there a problem where we can find multiple shrines of Ahlul Bayt for the same person? No, it's not. It's not a problem. Some say, but no, there has to only be one. Let there be one where we can agree that's where they're buried. But have maqamat. Is there a shame to see that there's a Sayyidah Zainab spot for her in Egypt 
or the lovers of Ahlul Bayt can rejuvenate their uh, devotion with her there. I know in Afghanistan they claim that there's a, a grave for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. They say, call it Mazar Sharif, the blue mosque in Mazar Sharif. They say that's where Amir al is. Let the people say that Imam Ali is here, there, whatever. The evidence is still there. But let there be many places to remember the Ahlul Bayt in all three continents. You have in the Arabian Peninsula, you have in the Great Levant, and you have in North Africa, Lady Zainab, salamu alayhi. There's nothing wrong with that. Let there be, but let's not mess up history at the end of the day. Because even in this discussion, it's debated. Because it's debated, we can leave room to say that it's beautiful. If I'm in Egypt, what's wrong with me visiting that place and crying for my lady, salamu alayhi. It could be another daughter of Amir al-Mu'minin. Nonetheless, let me remember my Ahlul Bayt. Some people make the biggest deals over these things. And we've noticed how many hajat have been answered at the shrine of Lady Zainab in Surya as well. Just go where you feel your connection is there. No need to have these arguments and fights. Of course, if you say to the Egyptians that she's buried in Sham, they'll get mad at you. But if you say to those who believe she is buried in Sham that she's buried in Egypt, because we're talking textually, they'll get mad at you. Forget it. Visit Sayyida Zainab salam, where you believe by the ulama's advice, she is there. But the majority, just for consensus purposes, say she is buried in a sham. How this came to be, how this happened, brothers and sisters, is very interesting. Because whatever opinion you take, at the end of the day, Lady Zainab was held captive twice. She was a captive by the orders of Banu two times, irrespective of where she went, a captive twice. Once in Karbala, and once when she gets back to Medina. This isn't an easy life, brothers and sisters. It's not simple. It's not easy at all. And did she die a shahida or no? Because many will say, well, shaheed is one that dies in the battlefield. No, you can die shaheed today without raising a sword or anything like that. The hadith is there. Ala man mata ala hubbi ali Muhammadin. Mata shahida. Whoever dies with the love of Muhammad and al Muhammad dies a shaheed. I tell you, is there someone who loved Muhammad and al Muhammad more than Zayda Zainab herself? The Ahlul Bayt herself? Of course not. Ba'dan, furthermore, she dies a year later from Karbala. It's not surprising that she dies because of Karbala itself. So she is definitely a shaheed, a martyr in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the hadith is also beautiful that says, when a person dies, their most beloved comes to them. Whoever you love the most, they will come to you. The hadith just stops there. What does that mean? You can find this in Wasail al-Shia. You can find it in many places. That the person, a believer, when he dies, he or she, Allah honors them by having them see their most beloved approach them. That's why we got narrations. Amir al-Mu'mineen approaches his lovers. You loved Imam Ali, Imam Ali might come to you. This is the biggest of honor. One can only imagine, if that's the case for us, who came to you, Ya Lady Zainab, Salamullahi alayki? Would it have been Aba Abdullah? Would it have been Imam al Hussein, Amir al-Mu'mineen? Your mother, there's no doubt among all of them, definitely one stands out, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. When you think Zainab, it doesn't take much to then think of Abu al-Fadl. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was the guardian to Lady Zainab alayhi salam. His sister, his older sister of course, and how he devoted and loved her salamullahi alayhi was something remarkable. The relationship between that duo, that brother and sister combination, is something unique and beautiful. Something we can take lessons from. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, you see many exchanges between him and Lady Zainab in Karbala. Many exchanges. To the point where he begins to tell Lady Zainab on the 10th, that my beloved sister, I'm not having patience any longer. After one by one they all leave, I think I'm going to talk to Imam Hussein. Sayyidah Zainab says, but you are his backbone. Abu al-Fadl says, but I can't stand here any longer. He goes to Abu Abdullah and he asks him, Sayyidi wa Mawlai, can you give me the honor to go and fight them? Imam Hussein embraces Abu al-Fadl. He says to him, Ya Abu al-Fadl, you are my flag bearer. And if you go and you are taken, who will represent me today? Who will stand for us today like you could? I don't want you to go and fight because I hate the thought of losing you. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas agrees. This is his imam ordering him. He goes back, but this time he sees children crying. Abu al-Fadl looks and he sees, I can't handle that. I go back, I'm in pain. 
let me be killed by the swords, it's less pain than hearing the children of Aba Abdullah saying al atash al atash The swords are more merciful than that. Let me go, I can't handle this. He goes to Imam Hussein once more. Aba Abdullah sees him insisting, he says, fine. If that's the case, at least go and get them some water. That's all I want you to do. Aba al fadh before he sets off, he embraces Imam Hussein. He embraces Lady Zainab. He gives them all one last farewell and he gets on his horse. Aba al fadl al-Abbas holds on to the water bag and he sets off to the Furat. As he is on his way, Salamullahi alayhi, he sees multiple people protecting the river. He fights and charges all of them. They run away from him as soon as they are faced with his might. He then drops down to the river, brothers and sisters. One of the saddest moments in Islamic history. A moment like this truly will never ever repeat. Like the details and the ways it was repeated. This devoted man, this lover of Ahlul Bayt, the brother of Zainab and Hussein, the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen, goes to the water with all his majesty and glory. They say, Abel Fad, don't think he's just this strong warrior. He has the foresight of ulama and the anbiya. Imam al-Sadiq says, Kana ammuna al-Abbas nafidha al-Basira. Our uncle Abbas had pristine foresight, knowing the rights of his imam. He goes to the water. The water comes up to his knees, salamullahi alayhi. Then he brings down the water bag and fills it up. He fills it up. He then wants to take a sip of that cold furat, drink it and replenish his thirst. He brings both his hands to the river. And it's like the poet says it beautifully. When he raises those two hands, you can see his reflection in the water. He doesn't see himself, he sees Aba Abdullah. How much he loves his brother Aba Abdullah. He looks at the water and he has this dialogue with himself. The likes of which truly represent a scholar to the highest caliber. He says to himself, Ya nafsu min ba'd al-Husayni huni wa ba'dahu ma kunti anta kuni hadha Husaynun sharibu al-manuni wa tashrabina barid al-ma'ini ay hat ma hadha fi'al dini wa la fi'al as-sadiq al-amini O self you decide to drink the coldness of this water while Hussein is drinking the syrup of death. This is not from your character, ya nafsi, O oh myself, nor is it the character of those who come from the family of the Prophet. I will not drink when Hussein is thirsty. He looks at that water and he throws it back into the river, letting himself be thirsty. He maintains his ground. He stands up. He mounts his horse. And our master, Abba al -Fad. this is why he is called Babu al-Hawaij. You ever have a haja? Ask it through Abba al fadl al-Abbas. He gets on his horse and he begins to recite to himself. It's not easy. You need to give yourself that motivation. He begins to say, لا أرهب الموت إذا الموت زقى حتى أوارى في المصاليت لقى نفسي لنفس المصطفى الطهر وقى إني أنا العباس I do not fear death when death comes to me and I will stand in front of it and I will face it and nor will it stop me from fulfilling my obligation what's he thinking about? he's thinking about his role of getting water to his Ahlul Bayt Abel Fadl Abbas brothers and sisters you all know what happened here as he is making his way back to the tents on that horse returning back these men come out of nowhere surrounding him he charges through them they realize they are unable to get to Abel Fadl with his might and bravery Abel Fadl al Abbas makes his way until he gets by the palm tree, one of the enemies of Allah is hiding behind it. And he waits for the moment Abel Fadl makes his way across him. Abel
al fadl al Abbas gets near and near. This man holds on to his sword. As soon as he sees Abba al Fadl, he jumps at our Imam, swinging his sword and cutting off his right hand. When that happens, Abba al Fadl al Abbas begins to say, Wallah, in qata'tumu yameeni, inni uhami abadan an dini, wa'an imam sadiq al yaqini, sibt al nabi tahir al amini, by Allah you have cut off my right hand. <laughs> You have cut off my right hand and I will stand and be persistent against the enemies of Allah. Nor will I be afraid for I am serving the master of the youth of paradise. O self, be forbearant. Do not allow this moment to shake you. By Allah, they have removed my right hand. Abu al al Abbas with just one arm, this arm is holding on to the water brothers and sisters continues on his way as he is bleeding and bleeding Mawlana Abba al he makes his way towards the tents he's just rushing now he wants to get there soon as he is making his way another La'een is hiding behind the tree in the distance uh, he waits for Abba al to make his way to him as soon as Abba al gets near and near he drums out at him and he swings his sword and he severs the left arm of Abba al When that happens, he begins to say, Ya nafsu la takhshi min al kufari wa absari bi rahmat al jabbari ma'a al nabiy sayyid al muhtari qad qata'u bi baghihim yasari fa aslihim ya rabb harra al nari. O self, do not be a Afraid of these kuffar, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate you and do not fear them for one moment. By Allah, they have severed my left hand. And so I ask you, Ya Rabbal Alameen, engulf them with your flame that never cools and get rid of them, Ya Allah, until they return to you and meet you in the day of judgment and ultimately they get to Jahannam. He may makes his dua, why? He has no hands to fight. So he has to make that dua. Brothers and sisters, in that moment, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is surrounded. He is unable to continue to guard and guide his horse. One man approaches Abu al-Fadl, begins to lunge at him with his spear. One man lunges his spear to the thigh of Abu al-Fadl. <laughs> Harmala goes. He aims his arrows at our master Abel Fal. He shoots the arrow to the right eye of our beloved Imam. That eye that was kissed by Aba Abdullah and Amir al Mu'mineen. One man comes around him. He grabs a wooden pole. He hits the head of Abel Fal. He comes to the other side. He hits him on that side and he falls off his horse. Abel Fal, he falls off. You normally grab the ground with your two hands. Our master had no hands to save his fall. He lands straight on his face. Salamullahi alayhi. One man comes and kicks him to his side. Another one comes and stands and hits him on his head. They surround Abu al He calls that moment Akhi Hussein Master Brother Hussein Come and aid me Abba Abdullah rushes to Abbas Angry like the lion he was Kills all the enemies of Allah He says out Alad in Kasara Zahri now my back has broken. He goes to Abbas. He cradles his head on his lap. Salamullahi alayhi. Although Abbas cannot see because of the blood and arrow on his eye, he begins to say, do not kill me. Let me wait for Hussein. Abba Abdullah kisses his forehead. He then recognizes the touch of Abba Abdullah. Abba al-Fadl al-Abbas. 
Abbas with his faint and broken voice begins to say, Habibi Hussein. He then removes his head from his lap. Imam Hussein brings it back. He says, why Abbas, do you remove your head? You all know where I'm going. He says, because now you have my head on your lap. In a few moments, who will have your head on their lap. In a few moments, Shamar will be the one standing on your chest. You have me, who's going to have you soon? Hussein, one request, do not take me back to the tents. I promise, Sukain al I'd give them water. Hussein, do not take me, leave me by the furat. Allow me to be here, Ya Allah. Sayyid Muhsin, um, Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim in the 1960s says, I was given the honor to go to the Haram of Abel Fad in the basement to see his actual Qabr. And we know Abel Fad was this tall warrior, so we expected to see a very large taboot. We saw one fitting for a child. Why is the Qabr of Abel Fad so small? Sayyid Muhsin was asked, Mawlana, why is his Qabr so small when we hear he was tall? Sayyid Muhsin Hakim says, I wonder how many times did they cut him to pieces and pieces such that they put him in this grave? Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ma'atam al Hussein, Ya Hussein, up, up, Ya Hussein, tonight's the night of Abbas, all together, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. يا عباس يا عباس يا عباس all together all together يا حسين عباس كاتله غير مهشر هو عباس